Well, thank you all for joining us for a conversation on the coast, a federal town hall on the environment for constituents from Burnaby to Bowen Island, Lillooet to Lonsdale and Gambier Island to Garibaldi. My name is Anita McPhee and I use the pronouns she and her. I'm the executive director for Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, British Columbia, and I'm pleased to be here to get us started. I'm Taltan and I'm Plinkett and I'm coming to you from the territory of Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples. And I just wanna say thank you and say madu in our language means thank you for being here. Um, I just wanna take a moment right now of silence to pay our respects to the indigenous children that were recently found in unmarked graves across Canada, 215 in Kamloops, 715 in Saskatchewan, 104 in southwestern Man Manitoba. And I just want to acknowledge that we're wearing orange to, to remember the children. And we'll just take a few, just take a moment to remember these Indigenous children. Thank you. So we're with you on Zoom, streaming live to Facebook, and we'll also have a captioned version of the town hall available on our YouTube channel next week. Climate change and biodiversity loss are among the most pressing challenges facing the world today. British Columbians like you are worried about the future of our communities, which depend on nature for clean air, water, and food. Our federal leaders have, have set ambitious land and ocean conservation goals, including support for Indigenous-led protected areas to help stem the biodiversity emergency. But how close are they to meeting those targets? Well, let's find out. It's our honor to facilitate this important conversation with you tonight. Now, I'd like to introduce you to, to my wonderful co-host, Ross Jameson. Ross is our Ocean Conservation Manager with CPAWS BC and advises all levels of government on how to design and implement marine protected areas in BC. Ross, over to you. Thank you, Anita. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the unceded and ancestral lands of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And I'm very grateful to live and work on these lands and also grateful to be here uh, tonight with you all. Uh, I'd like to remind you that this event, like all of our virtual events at CPAWS BC, uh, are governed by um, our community guidelines for our online spaces. So the link to those guidelines can be found in uh, both the Zoom chat below as well as the Facebook comments. So we just request that you all be respectful in your comments, please. And if there's anyone that you think should be with us here tonight, uh, please feel free to send them the direct link to our Facebook Live or share the link on your social media. You'll see the direct Facebook Live link in the chat box below. And uh, so for tonight, this is a little bit about how our program is going to go. After each of our panelists here introduce themselves, we'll launch into the topics of the evening, uh, ranging from federal conservation targets to endangered species protection and uh, post-pandemic economic recovery. So all three panelists have about one minute for introductions and about 90 seconds uh, for responses to questions and discussion topics, please. We've received so many great questions in advance from our viewers on Zoom and our registrants for the event. Uh, you can add your question to the, using the chat box in the bottom of the panel on your screen or live comment on Facebook. So with limited times, questions will be chosen at random. And thank you very much to our tech support team behind the scenes for helping us keep an eye on the clock, keeping us on track and answering any questions you may have in a chat message. And now without further ado, I would like to invite, uh, first of all, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada, 
uh, and Member of Parliament for North Vancouver, the Honorable Jonathan Wilkinson, to introduce himself, please. Uh, sure, you, you did a pretty good job there. Um, so I'm Jonathan Wilkinson. Uh, I'm joining you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Happy to be with you to talk a little bit about nature. Uh, I would just say that there are two great crises, environmental crises facing the world today. One is obviously climate change, but the other, which is no less pressing, is the, uh, the accelerating decline in biodiversity in this world. Uh, and we obviously need to be acting to address that both through protected spaces, but also through actions to protect and enhance the status of species that are presently at risk. And I'm looking forward to the conversation this evening. Thank you very much, Minister Wilkinson. Uh, now over to Patrick Wheeler, Member of Parliament for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast and Sea to Sky Country. Thanks, Ross. Um, and I do want to start by acknowledging that I'm streaming from my office in, in the traditional unceded territories of Coast Salish peoples. Uh, and I just want to say that I stand behind Indigenous peoples across Canada in, in these very difficult times. Uh, and I, it's great to see the people tuning in from right across BC and right across the country on a steamy Tuesday night. Um, but I just want to give a little bit of background on, on those that don't know me yet. Um, you know, I was elected in 2019. I've been the chair of our caucus in BC since summer of last year. I'm, I'm on the Natural Resources Committee um, and I'm an active member of the, uh, the Bipartisan Climate Caucus, um, among other um, uh, caucuses. And uh, um, I got into politics coming from an environmental and Aboriginal law background. So it's always a pleasure to be able to speak about matters of environmental conservation. And I've had the opportunity to work on projects around the world for the UN Development Program focused on uh, international water bodies. So, uh, you know, this is really one of the reasons that I got into, uh, into politics and, uh, and really to, to focus on those two, two uh, dual crises that, uh, that, that Minister Wilkinson mentioned. So, so thank you for very, mu very much for having me on today and looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, MP Weiler. I really appreciate your thoughts. And uh, now over to Terry Beach, a member of parliament for Burnaby North and Seymour. Uh, Parliamentary Secretary for the Department of Fisheries, Oceans and Canadian Coast Guard and Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Economic Development and Official Languages. Over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I am joining you on the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, I have two daughters, Nova, she's two and a half, uh, Solar, she's five months. And uh, both provide uh, excellent motivation to work on the many issues that we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the fact that 25 people have died in Burnaby uh, due to heat exhaustion. Uh, that is currently weighing heavily on uh, me and my neighbors uh, and certainly isn't unrelated to the conversation that we're having tonight. Uh, we need to continue to do everything we can to fight climate change with unrivaled determination. Uh, in the previous parliament, I uh, served in the Ministry of Science, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Transport. Uh, I worked on the Fisheries Act, the Oceans Act, the Oil uh, Tanker Moratorium Act, uh, the Hazardous and Abandoned Boat legislation, as well as the Zero Emission Vehicle Strategy. Uh, I am a huge proponent of having a price on uh, pollution and, uh, you know, work closely with uh, Jonathan, actually, in the previous parliament on our comprehensive whale strategy. Uh, as well as greatly expanding our marine protected areas. Uh, most recently, uh, I think most people here would be familiar with the $647 million strategic salmon initiative that was recently announced, uh, the blue economy strategy that we're working on and the transition from open net pen fin fish aquaculture uh, on the West Coast. I happen to be a big fan of our local minister of climate change uh, and uh, and the environment and uh, continue to applaud our increasing ambition when it comes to climate change, including today's announcement that uh, non-electric personal vehicles uh, will no longer be sold instead of 2040, but from 2035. So moving that up five years. And I know that we're not gonna be able to touch on everything I wanna talk about tonight. So if people are interested in learning more about what we're up to, I publish a quarterly environmental report. It's on my website, terrybeachmp.ca, but hopefully we'll be able to cover a lot of things this evening. So thank you very much for having us. I hope so too. So thank you very much for those words. And uh, I'm very excited to dive into a lot of the topics you all have mentioned uh, as well. So uh, with that, we will dive in. And so the first discussion topic to, to point to tonight is an important one. Uh, Canada has endeavored to protect 25% of its land 
and ocean by 2025 toward 30% by 2030. Uh, this is the minimum scientists say is, is necessary to safeguard the nature that we depend on. Uh, Canada is currently sitting around 12.5% for land protection and 13.81 for ocean protection. Now, uh, the recent federal budget announced a historic investment uh, for the protection of nature with over 3 billion uh, coming in the next five years. So MP Weiler, if I may start with you, can you tell us a bit more about the plan to meet these targets and share why you think uh, that this work is so important and relevant to people living here on the coast? Uh, certainly, Ross. So thanks for the question. Um, well, Canada's nature provides countless cultural benefits and, and it is the foundation for thousands of jobs right across the country from fishing to tourism. Um, and I think most people have a newfound appreciation for, for the intrinsic value that nature has really over the last year and a half as an escape from the city. Um, and, uh, you know, when you live here, you know, how can you not, you know, have that type of appreciation? I think, but I think sometimes we go too far and we, we almost love it to death. Um, but some of the, the numbers that you mentioned are really important. Um, but, you know, one other that I'll, that I'll mention is, um, is, is really focused on, on biodiversity. In Canada, species at risk have declined by over 40% over the last 50 years. So um, those, those targets are necessary so we can arrest that decline. We're gonna need that in Canada. We're gonna need it right around the world where some of those numbers are actually uh, quite a bit worse. Um, and, it's, and it's more than the numbers. It's about making sure we protect the most sensitive areas and that we don't have a patchwork of areas that's going to um, get in the way of having a proper, proper habitat for especially some of the more mobile species. So it's also a critical part of Canada's plan to fight climate change, a healthy forest, especially old growth forests, um, and oceans can, can store a lot of carbon. Uh, but conserving land costs money, and you mentioned in the budget, um, but we often don't appropriately measure the value that intact ecosystems provide. Uh, rather, we just focus on what the value that we can get from what we extract from land. Um, there, there is growing movement now towards um, environment or economic valuation of environmental ecosystem services. And there's some great local examples, including in West Vancouver, where they put a, a valuation on natural assets, which is, I think, the direction that we need to go in. Um, but uh, the federal government, we do understand the, the value of this, and that's why we have that 3.2 billions that have, have been invested in budget 2021 uh, to, to expand and create new protected areas in Canada. So this is gonna go to create and expand parks. It's gonna involve working with First Nations, other orders of government, uh, private landowners, and collectively this is gonna move us ahead in, in reaching our targets of 25% of land and water by 2025. And it also builds on the previously largest investment of uh, 1.35 billion in budget 2018. Um, but, I, but I think it's always good to give some local examples and you'll see to, to my left here um, was uh, um, a, conser a conservation area that was created in Pemberton where uh, 87 hectares of land, which are highly ecologically valuable with wetlands and old growth, as well as home for species at risk was protected uh, as part of the Ryan River Conservation Area, which is great. Um, and uh, you know, on my on my right side here, you'll see um, How Sound or Catsum, uh, where where there's an incredible amount of work right now that's been done to better understand all of the treasures that are within this this basin. Um, and there's been some important work done over the course of the last few years to protect what is a globally unique. Um, glass sponge reefs that are there. Um, and it's very important that the federal government works with all other orders of government because uh, in provincial land in BC or, in, or land in the province, the federal government only owns about 6%. So it's gonna be working with the provinces um, and also working with private landowners to make sure that we can bring in, into effect the protection that we need. Thanks very much, MP Wyler. It's great to hear you touch on the pieces around um, collaborative planning for these protected areas and, and thinking about quality, not just quantity of, uh, of protection in BC and Canada. So that's great. Uh, Minister Wilkinson, anything to add uh, to MP Wyler's thoughts there? Uh, let, me, let me talk to, to the plan to meet the targets because I think most of the folks that are attending this are pretty well aware of why this is important and relevant. Um, so it is different in the marine versus the terrestrial space. On the marine side, um, we made enormous progress from like 1% to, as you said, 13.8% over the course of four years. 
Um, that was very much in partnership with Indigenous people. Some of the big chunks, I had the great fortune at the time to be Minister of Fisheries. I was in the Arctic with the leader of the Inuit um, announcing uh, Taliuptupimanga and uh, Tuviatut, which were big areas uh, important for Inuit peoples. But that pathway, I think we've got a pretty good sense of the areas that are really high in terms of ecological value where we are looking to protect. And of course, the federal government has broad jurisdiction in the marine area, which makes some of that not simple, but, but easier than terrestrial. On the terrestrial side, of course, most of the land is controlled by the provinces and territories. And so we need to work with the provinces and territories to, to move in the direction that we need to move. Um, we did the call out for uh, on the pathway uh, Canada, under the Canada Nature Fund, the pathway to target one. We funded a number of those programs, many of which were indigenous led um, and were the creation of indigenous conserved and protected areas. Um, but there were a bunch of them we didn't have enough money to fund. And so where we're starting with the new allocation of resources that we have is a number of those projects that are good projects to get going on the ground. Of course, we're looking at other areas that are of high biodiversity value and particularly intact ecosystems, um, places like old growth forests in British Columbia and looking to partner with the provincial governments to actually do some protected spaces that, that are going to, to essentially help us to ensure that those remain intact, but also looking at trying to actually ensure that we are doing it representatively across the different regions of Canada, the north, the mid Canada space and, and creating things like urban parks near, near cities uh, where people can actually experience nature. So we have a pretty good sense, but obviously it's both bottom up in terms of people bringing ideas to us and also looking at the areas around particularly biodiversity and the value of biodiversity in specific spaces. Thank you very much, Minister. Those are great points. And I, uh, I appreciate the context on, on looking back as well as the plan for going forward. Uh, now over to you, MP Beach, on, on that point, can you kind of touch on a little bit some of the progress that DFO's um, part to play in this has made uh, on, on reaching some of those targets and, and how will this benefit life on the coast? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I've I've luck I've been lucky to have uh, kind of two kicks at the can in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans um, with regards to this. So um, I was there with Dominic uh, LeBlanc uh, and Jonathan for a while uh, in 2017, 2018, and now uh, for the entirety of this mandate. And um, from the marine side. Uh, there were significant challenges, especially since we wanted to protect so much area much faster than we were uh, able to under the existing tools that we had. Uh, that's why we uh, worked hard uh, to change the Oceans Act. We came up with this principle of being able to uh, freeze the fr uh, footprint for areas uh, of interest. And of course, one of the most significant areas of interest uh, is right off the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, which will provide uh, significant uh, biodiversity opportunities and, and protection. Um, it's interesting because a lot of people don't think about where our oceans actually are. Uh, people just look at the Pacific and say, wow, that's huge. Um, the majority of the ocean, when it comes to opportunity to protect, uh, over 60% of our ocean is in the Arctic. Uh, significant, uh, the next largest uh, chunk of water is in uh, Atlantic Canada, followed by British Columbia. So British Columbia actually has the most protected area, almost 24%. Uh, but when you end up translating the numbers, that only gets us to less than 10% of the area that we need to protect for the country. So uh, we need to continue to uh, find opportunities to uh, protect and conserve these, these sensitive areas. And hopefully, uh, we'll find ways to do that uh, in ways that will also grow the economic opportunity that we can get out of our oceans, which is what the blue economy strategy is all about. Thank you. And, and yes, keen to hear uh, more about the blue economy strategy uh, uh, coming up in our event. Uh, so thank you very much. Over to you, Anita, for our, uh, our next topic here. Okay, hey, thanks, Ross, again. <laughs> Uh, my question is, is how will you work with provinces and territories to make sure these resources support important conservation priorities? And how will you work to support First Nations in advancing Indigenous-led conservation initiatives in their territories? MP Weiler, you're up first. Well, thanks, thanks for that question, Anita. Um, and I, and I, I mentioned some of the important priorities uh, earlier from a local level and, and the reasons why. 
But I think, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the how is just as important. And uh, Indigenous peoples have been stewards of this land and these waters since time immemorial. And, and it's abundantly clear that we do have a lot to learn from Indigenous peoples when it comes to conservation. Um, and Indigenous leadership in conservation, um, which, you know, just translated into the, the Guardians program in Canada and the Indigenous protected and conserved areas, is a key part of our commitment that's going to get us to conserving 25% of lands and waters by 2025. Um, it's a key priority for, for this government. You know, across the country right now, there are already uh, 30 Indigenous protected and conserved areas, including uh, many in BC that, uh, that I know, um, uh, you know, J Jonathan had a hand in, in getting set up. Um, and in budget 2021, we do have funding to, to increase and continue the Guardians program. Um, and, uh, and that's a program that provides Indigenous peoples with greater opportunity to exercise responsibility and stewardship of their traditional lands and waters. Um, and because of the land ownership numbers I've referenced earlier, there's, there's a role for all orders of government to, to play in, in meeting this. Um, and uh, conservation initiatives very much form part of the ongoing negotiation tables with First Nations. In my writing, there's a large interest in them. Um, these, these programs are continuing to evolve, so they're fit for purpose in, in achieving the right type of conservation and putting First Nations really at the, um, you know, at the front of that. And, uh, and you know, I'm working very closely with them to be able to leverage those. Um, I'm also talking regularly with uh, my provincial counterparts about their conservation priorities. And also I'm always on Jonathan and Terry's case about where those areas are locally that we need to prioritize. Um, and, and in the coming months, we're going to be, you know, working very closely with our partners, including provinces and territories to translate this commitment into more action. So I'll just say stay tuned for that. Thank you. Minister Wilkinson, you're up next. Thank you. Um, I think I, I remembered to unmute this time. Um, so, um, look, let, let me say a couple of things. Uh, the first is... Um, Indigenous-led conservation is extremely important in terms of making progress to the targets that we have established. And it's not just Canada. I mean, Canada is part of what's called the High Ambition Coalition, which is countries that have committed to the 30 by 30, and it's led by Costa Rica and France. Um, but Indigenous conservation initiatives have been critical to getting us to where we are. And I would say that they're critical both because um, I think Indigenous per perspectives in, in, in the context of nature um, are increasingly convincing the rest of us that, that we need to do better than what we have done in the past. But it's also because I think the federal government and Indigenous peoples across this country are very aligned in terms of uh, needing to, uh, to move forward with respect to conservation and protection more generally. At, at times, uh, I think much more aligned than some provinces and territories, provincial governments and ter territorial governments are. And, and certainly indigenous peoples are powerful voices in convincing uh, provinces and territories to up, effectively up their game. Um, we, have, uh, we have invested significantly in indigenous conserved and protected areas in the Guardians program that Patrick talked about um, in, uh, in a particular program around conservation for species at risk that includes things like protecting Southern Mountain caribou that we did in conjunction with First Nations here in British Columbia. Um, that's really, really important. Um, and I would say that, uh, that I think that's reflected in the CEPAWS report that just came out, the report card that came out, that talks a little bit about each of the different jurisdictions and how they have performed with respect to conservation and protection. Where we could use your help um, is trying to ensure that this is on the radar screen more fundamentally um, with some of the provinces and territories in Canada who uh, to this point have not been as proactive um, or perhaps have not yet fully understood the imperative that we have to move forward. So um, that would be certainly helpful from our perspective. Thank you both for your answers. Um, MP Beach, is your turn. Can you speak to some of the opportunities you see for DFO to support Indigenous-led conservation in BC? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I think I'd start by saying, uh, you know, with regards to working with not just Indigenous people, but the provinces, um, the enormity of our challenge when it comes to conservation is so great that we just can't afford to have anybody sitting on the bench. So we have to use whatever tools that we can to proactively bring all players to the table to, to take on this fight in a whole bunch of different areas. Um, uh, 
I, I don't know if we're, we're primarily BC focused tonight with our audience or if it's more national, but uh, if we take a, a BC examples, uh, I think what we're seeing with the Coast Guard, with the new indigenous uh, led Coast Guard uh, programs uh, off of the BC coast, I think that's an incredibly uh, great grounding for uh, how we should be rolling out more uh, programs at the future at DFO. Um, indigenous people uh, live in coastal communities where a lot of these protections need to take place and where a lot of the work needs to happen uh, and where their, their knowledge is frankly stronger than ours. Um, so we need to make sure that the programs that we put into place isn't just about, you know, hiring more people at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans office. We need to make sure that we're actually actioning work on the ground. And I think in terms of capacity building, I think in terms of partnership, I was having a, a great conversation today uh, at a Blue Economy Roundtable with a First Nations group uh, who talked about the idea of having actually more DFO representatives uh, work directly out of indigenous communities so that those hiccups that you might not be able to see from an office in Ottawa or an office in downtown Vancouver and that knowledge uh, is inherent with the programming that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has. So I, I think that there are transformative opportunities like that that we should continue to take advantage of. Um, but now with the passage of, of UNDRIP and that becoming uh, the law of the land right across Canada, uh, I think that's going to be transformative across all of the ministries, not just DFO. And that's a, that's a huge opportunity for all of us. Thank you. And thank you all for your answers. And over to you, Ross. Thank you, Anita. Uh, so next topic we wanted to approach you all with um, revolves around, around the biodiversity crisis. So as you all know, you know, we are in the midst of a global biodiversity crisis and it's, the situation is no different here in BC. You know, wildlife populations across the province are struggling with over 1800 species of animals and plants at risk of extinction today. Um, more than any other province and territory in Canada, actually. So with these alarming rates of species decline and really no provincial species at risk legislation, the federal protection of species at risk is more important than ever right now. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the recent progress on habitat protection for species at risk, uh, say caribou, orca, or, or others uh, here in BC? And um, I'll start with, with you, Minister Wilkinson. Uh, I'll pass it over to you for the first response, please. Sure. Um, I mean, I think uh, many of you who are familiar with the Species at Risk Act will know that the, the, the kind of deal at the beginning was the provinces agreed that they would put into place their own Species at Risk Act to ensure that, um, that they were accountable to, uh, to provide appropriate protection for species. And of course that, that really didn't get done in very many jurisdictions across the country. And so you're right, the, the federal act remains a very important piece of legislation um, to ensure that, uh, that we are thinking and acting appropriately. That being said, the Federal Species at Risk Act until very recently had not been very well implemented, not been fully implemented. Uh, we had you know, very long backlogs of the identification of critical habitat and and, uh, and not a lot of action. And so one of the things that we committed to do was to look to ensure that the act could be implemented in a thoughtful way. Um, and that means obviously having to make some choices, but so we, we put resources into ensuring that the work around reporting was actually getting done and didn't take five years to actually get the, the identification of critical habitat and other things done and those backlogs are gone. Um, we move towards in conjunction with what's called SARAC, which is the advisory body that, that has uh, a range of different perspectives on it, including many environmental organizations, um, towards a, a, a strategy that focused on priority places and priority species to try to actually start to make some real progress on the ground. And I think that is making some good progress. And, and ideally, we are moving towards eventually nature agreements with provinces and territories where they are undertaking commitments that will be informed by resourcing that the federal government will bring to the table to help. With respect to some of the specific um, areas of progress, I mean, certainly the protected areas are important in terms of protecting habitat and protecting species, but specific species, I, I would tell you one of the things that I'm most proud of is the work that we did with West Moberly and Soto First Nations on Southern Mountain Caribou, where 
we essentially worked with them. They had developed the maternal breeding pro program um, themselves, and they were looking for a partnership to help to ensure that we were addressing some of the habitat issues. And we worked through over a period of time, protection of certain areas, changes in the way of utiliz utilizing other areas, uh, funding for the maternal uh, penning program, and, and a number of different elements that I will tell you, I think will fundamentally change the way those herds actually uh, are, are going to, to survive and thrive. They're one of the few areas where Southern Mountain Caribou numbers are going up, not down. That was really important. I would say we've taken some big steps on Spotted Owl just in the last few, uh, few weeks and certainly some big steps on Orca, including creating sanctuary areas, looking at prioritizing their feeding source uh, and a whole range of other things. So I think there's some, been some pretty good progress here in BC. There, there have been some pretty good areas of progress in other provinces as well, but certainly here in British Columbia, as you say, we, we have an abundance or we certainly have a large number of species, many of which we need to be very thoughtful about because they are in decline. Well, I, I'm happy to talk about the whales because uh, Jonathan already talked about the caribou. So does that, does that, that, that only that only sounds fair to me, MP Beach. So please, please <laughs> well, touch on if you will. Uh, I spent a lot of time on this file, so happy happy to talk about it. Uh, Jonathan will talk to you about caribou for for 24 hours if you let him. Uh, he he did a lot of work on that file. He also did a lot of work on the whale file. Um, we had a comprehensive endangered whale strategy. It included uh, the St. Lawrence belugas, uh, the northern Atlantic uh, right whales, and of course our southern resident killer whales. And I would imagine for this uh, group, we'd want to focus on the southern resident killer whales. Um, there was kind of three overarching um, areas that we focused on: uh, pollutants, uh, noise, vessel noise, and of course prey availability. Uh, and that spanned across uh, three different ministries. So uh, prey availability is more of the the DFO function. Um, the pollution is more of the environmental function and the ship noise is more of uh, the Ministry of Transport. So I actually got to take it on from, from two different ministries because I was in transport at one point and, and DFO at another. Uh, and those uh, regulations uh, came into place and the funding was made uh, available for it. And uh, Minister Wilkinson mentioned uh, the sanctuary zones, but actually new regulations have come out every single year uh, since the launch of this strategy, uh, with our government committed to restoring, not just protecting, but restoring this population, these populations. And um, we've seen, I think, four calves in the last uh, two years. Um, but this is not something that we can let our foot up off uh, on the gas. Uh, the southern resident population has ebbed and flowed between 70 and 100 whales over the last couple of generations. And we are certainly on the lower end of that spectrum today. Uh, so uh, we need to continue to make sure that everything that we're doing and all the things that we're talking about uh, this evening, uh, that we push for those continued positive cumulative effects uh, that will allow biodiversity and all of our ecosystems to rise. Um, uh, in addition to these very specific um, uh, actions that have been taken for these very specific species. Thank you, MP Beach. And uh, maybe I'll throw it over to Anita for, for one other important species that we wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, around Pacific salmon. Yes, for sure. Everybody knows that uh, salmon's close to my heart. Uh, Sticking River is in my territory, Taltan territory, lots of good sockeye up there. Pacific salmon, so you know, uh, I just want to know the Pacific Salmon Strategy Initiative was announced in early June with further details released today. MP Beach, what will this do for the salmon populations on our coast and the communities that depend on them? So, so this is a topic that I can talk about all day, uh, that Patrick can talk about all day, and certainly Jonathan can talk about all day, as with any member of our caucus, I believe. Um, uh, cheers to Patrick and a shout out to Patrick as our Pacific caucus chair. It's his responsibility to stand up and uh, present our issues of the day uh, at national caucus. And I don't think a week went by where Patrick wasn't talking about wild salmon on the West coast. Um, to put it quite simply, we have an opportunity here uh, that Atlantic Canadians did not get when it came to the collapse of the cod fishery. Uh, we have an opportunity to save our wild Pacific salmon. And in a context where we just passed UNDRIP, 
and where uh, reconciliation is top of mind for all Canadians. Um, you can't really talk about reconciliation without talk in British Columbia, at least, without talking about wild Pacific salmon. Uh, the announcement of uh, $647 million for the Pacific salmon strategy is historic. Uh, it's an unprecedented uh, amount of funding. Uh, we need to make sure that we leverage every single penny uh, of that funding. Uh, stream keepers are very uh, uh, quick to say that every dollar that they receive, they can turn it into seven dollars. Um, we need to make sure that we are going to have uh, a stream by stream, river by river battle uh, to fight for every single salmon to ensure that future generations uh, can benefit from this resource. Uh, and it's going to take a full effort, not just from the federal government, but from the provincial government, indigenous governments, uh, and municipal governments as well. Uh, there are simply stressors that we are very well aware of through the Cohen Commission and, and other reports and work uh, with the wild salmon policy that have been done uh, that lie outside of the federal jurisdiction. Uh, we need to think about every decision that we're making environmentally from a salmon centric approach. How is our mining practices, our forestry practices? What are we doing in the ocean? What are we doing in fresh water? What are we doing in our estuaries? Um, if we're going to plant 2 billion trees, can some of those trees go to eroded uh, soil systems where uh, salmon used to spawn? Um, it needs to be a full government approach. And I wish it was five years ago. I wish it was 15 years ago, but we have those resources now. And it's going to be important that we take full advantage of this opportunity. Um, we made an announcement today uh, with regard to the commercial fishery and with regards to communal in, uh, indigenous fisheries. These are not easy decisions. They affect the very real livelihood and the ability for fishers to put food on the table for their families. Um, but uh, we need to make some tough decisions today to make sure that this resource is available for future generations. And that is something that uh, my minister is committed to. That is something that I am committed to. And that is something that our government is committed to. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Ross. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, and I wish we could hear from everyone on, on the salmon topic for sure. However, we would like to leave a bit of time to send it over to some audience questions that were submitted by people watching at home. Uh, so I, uh, our tech support has been choosing uh, questions here. So one attendee asks, uh, this unprecedented heat wave is a sign of our changing climate. Uh, how are you aligning climate and conservation policies to protect biodiversity and keep our planet livable for our children? Uh, I will leave this uh, out to whoever would like to, to respond. Um, maybe, maybe I can take a, a cut at that. That's a broad question and, and there's probably a whole bunch of different ways to, to go about answering it. But I think it's important that we do recognize how interlinked the climate and the biodiversity challenges are. Um, Terry was just talking about Pacific salmon and yes, part of it's about habitat. Um, and yes, part of it's about uh, stock management in terms of fisheries, but part of it's just about climate change. It's about the changing climate that is affecting um, the ability of salmon to get up the rivers and to reproduce. Um, it's also affecting their returns from open oceans. So I think we need to think about ways in which we can use investments in, in stemming biodiversity loss and, and turning that around, but also investments in climate in order to actually achieve co-benefits. And so there are a few different ways in which I think you can do that. So if you think about, for example, um, nature-based solutions for climate, like planting the 2 billion trees or restoring wetlands and grasslands, um, those also have, if you do it right, if you do it in a thoughtful way, co-benefits for a four species. So when you're planting 2 billion trees, you can plant them irrespective of, of the biodiversity needs of the country, or you can think about actually repairing seismic lines and, and cut blocks um, that are areas of, of importance for Southern Mountain and Boreal Caribou, for example. Um, you can get co-benefits if you do those uh, thoughtfully. Similarly, in the context of protected spaces, there are many areas in this country that are really important stores for carbon, that if we actually disturb them, we are going to create a much bigger problem for ourselves with respect to, uh, to the climate issue. Areas like the Hudson Bay lowlands, where we obviously, that it's important from a biodiversity perspective, but it's important from an intact carbon perspective. And so protecting that space has co-benefits for biodiversity and it has co-benefits for climate change. 
we need to be thoughtful about how we're addressing these and that we're leveraging the resources because resources are never infinite in a manner that actually achieves outcomes with respect to both issues. And that's certainly something that we're trying to do, but we are certainly always open to thoughts and ideas. Um, if, if I could add to what, what Jonathan just said, I, I think there's two, two things that I'd want to comment on. One is the international aspect of climate change and, and biodiversity, and also just drawing greater attention uh, to our oceans. Um, certainly the heat wave uh, and the forest fires of, of previous summers has drawn uh, a lot of attention to the very real impacts of, of climate change. Uh, what's happening in our oceans is also an immediate and very real uh, threat, uh, an existential threat that we need to take care of. And unfortunately, both of these issues, climate change and management of our ocean, uh, are both massive tragedy of the commons problems in that we are affected not just by what we're doing in Canada, uh, but what is happening in the rest of the world. Uh, and we really have a responsibility and a unique position in Canada, given that we are amongst uh, the top 10 polluters in the world, uh, but still generate uh, less than 2.3% uh, of all global pollution uh, to show you know, the, that 44% of pollution that is generated by the vast majority of countries, as well as to set an example for the top 10 countries that, that contribute almost 50% of pollution, um, to show that you can set a, a, a strategy that is thoughtful, that does not leave people behind uh, and that can grow our economy at the same time. And the reason that, that is important and the reason that I raise that particularly with this audience is that uh, in this uh, push to forever do more faster and we need to do those things, we need to make sure that we do it in a responsible way that is not leaving people economically behind. Uh, we saw what happened in the United States uh, when that happened, uh, you know, uh, people are able to take political advantage, uh, make call out slogans like making coal great again. We can't afford to backslide on that. Uh, so we need to continue to educate our population and continue um, to push forward these these uh, environmental policies that are so important to us in the quickest way possible uh, while being thoughtful about how these policies are affecting our economy and ensuring that the, the proper uh, economic transformative uh, pieces and transition pieces are in place as well. I just want to add one, a couple of things on that quickly. And, and uh, you know, I, I think, I think that's a key point that Terry raised there. You know, you're, um, it's unlikely to expect people anywhere around the world to focus on environmental protection when they don't have the ability to put food on the table. And so that's why it's so important that Canada be a, an active um, supporter of measures all around the world for countries to take actions both to mitigate climate change as well as to adapt climate to, to climate change. Um, there's been a recent doubling in the amount of support that Canada gives um, or is committing to give to, to countries around the world to, in those two areas, which I think is critically important. And I just want to add one thing to, to, to Jonathan's comments as well about one of the areas I think there is a, a tremendous opportunity for, for our country to look at more uh, for nature-based solutions to climate change in actually uh, planting new kelp and harvesting that. I think that's something that uh, we have huge opportunity with the uh, you know, one of the longest coastlines in the world to be able to take advantage of that and also to also deal with some issues locally with uh, ocean acidification. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you all for engaging in that. And uh, we're just scratching the surface. I wish we could dive in uh, to each of these individual topics and, and all these responses tonight uh, even further. But uh, I will pass it over to Anita at this point. Several people watching tonight want to hear from you, Minister Wilkinson. What steps are you taking to progress the Southern Strait of Georgia National Marine Conservation Area Reserve? And when will it be established? Will there be an announcement at the international meeting on marine conservation in June 2022? It's uh, a good question um, and because uh, as, as you folks will know very well, uh, this has been an ongoing conversation for some significant period of time. Um, I would love to see it accelerated, um, but this is a, a particular space where there are a number of Indigenous communities that have perspectives on this issue. Um, it's uh, not just one, there are quite a number. 
Um, and so working through all of those issues is a priority for us. And it's something where we need to achieve consensus uh, before we can move forward. So I would love to move forward very quickly, um, but I also, uh, you know, I, I wanna, wanna caution that uh, we do wanna do this in partnership um, and, and not just the federal government kind of overriding the perspectives of the legitimate perspectives of indigenous peoples who live in the area. Thank you. Back to, thank you. Um, over to you, Ross. Um, we're, we're getting pretty close to the time here. Yeah, absolutely. So we are nearing the end of the program today as we're coming up on seven. Uh, so thank you to everybody who submitted questions and our apologies uh, if we didn't have time to, to get to them all, but there's some fantastic ones. Uh, let's do this every week. Uh, no, so for those new faces joining in today, uh, you can keep in touch with us on the latest conservation updates at cpawsbc.org or follow us at cpawsbc on social media. Uh, I will now open the floor to each of our panelists for some, some final thoughts. Uh, I would request that we keep it to about 20 or 30 seconds just so we have time to uh, say goodbye tonight. Uh, but yeah, MP Weiler, can you start us off uh, with a few closing remarks? Yeah, I just want to say thanks for, for organizing this and everybody for tuning in tonight. It's been uh, a pleasure to, uh, you know, to take part in this. And it's just great to see the level of interest and all the great questions and comments in, in the chat. Um, and, uh, and I just really appreciate the work that, that you're doing to the pressure up on our government and all orders of government so that we're going to bring in the, the type, the level of protection that we know we need to, that the science is telling us that we need to. Um, and we're only going to be able to do it in partnership with groups like CPAWS, BC Parks Foundation, Nature Conservancy, and others. So um, continue to support work like yours. And um, uh, just thanks again. Thank you very much. And uh, MP Beach, any final words? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thank you for uh, organizing this, this very important town hall. I think the more that we can be talking about these issues, uh, the better off we will all be. Um, I, I think back to um, the before, you know, the, the pandemic times, uh, the massive uh, protests that we saw uh, for climate change. And I just want to comment on how empowering that was and how much that actually moved the needle of political possibility uh, for us to move faster, harder. Um, so I know there's a lot of people that are probably here tonight that work on these issues actively uh, and participate in environmental causes uh, on a whole spectrum of issues. Uh, I just wanna say that th that work uh, really does help move the needle and, and helps us to move faster because sometimes we hit uh, political constraints uh, that stop us from moving faster even when we want to. Uh, so keep up the good work and uh, please continue to stay in touch. I've had the opportunity to work with CPAWS now for five years and it's been, uh, it's been a great experience. So please keep up the good work. Likewise, MP Beach, it's always a pleasure. Uh, Minister Wilkinson, your closing remarks, please. So uh, again, thank you for organizing this. CPAWS has been a very important and constructive player on the, on the national scene in terms of not just protected areas, but conversations around species at risk. Um, you have a willing partner in this, in this federal government, and we're certainly interested in thoughts and ideas as to how we can go faster and further. Um, and, uh, and I would say that um, the one, I guess, takeaway ask, well, two takeaway asks I would say to you is, number one, keep pushing us. Always important that people are pushing for more. Um, but the second thing is, think about how you can influence the, 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 the governments in your own province and territory. It's very important in a country that is structured as Canada is, um, uh, constitutionally, that, that we have provinces and territories that understand that people really do want action taken, understanding that it's not always easy for provinces and territories. There needs to be a forcing function uh, if we are going to make the progress that, uh, that ultimately we need to make. Thank you very much. And over to you, Anita, for some closing remarks to end us tonight. Thanks, Ross. Well, it's our pleasure to host virtual events like this one. On behalf of Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society of British Columbia, I want to thank you all for tuning in today. And of course, I want to give a big thank you, Madhu, to our panelists, the Honourable Minister Jonathan Wilkinson, MP Patrick Weiler and MP Terry Beach for spending time with us tonight and for, the, for your thoughtful responses. I invite you all to continue this important conversation with your friends, your loved ones, and of course with your MP or MLA. And that's all from all of us. I want to thank you all again for watching. Madhu, good night. <laughs>